to this Fantasy Fellowship author Q&A session. I'm Erin and joining us today is Juliet E. McKenna. Juliet is a British Fantasy Award nominated author and since 1999 she's brought five fantasy series to her fans amongst other work. But today we're going to be talking about her new standalone novel The Cleaving which is a new and feminist retelling of her Arthurian legends. It's a great read. The Cleaving follows the tangled stories of four women as they fight to control their own destinies amid the wars and rivalry that will determine the destiny of Britain. It is out on April the 11th and is published by Angry Robot Books. Juliet, thank you so much for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started with the first question, if that's OK with you. Let's go. Wonderful. OK, so as I mentioned a minute ago, The Cleaving features four women who could be seen on the beautiful cover. Would you be able to introduce us to each of them? The artwork is absolutely stunning. Yeah, <laughs> it really, really is. Um, well, we start with Arthur's mother, Igraine, who I've always felt gets very short changed in all of the retellings I've come across and certainly in any of the movies because uh, she is, they, Merlin really does the dirty on her. But yeah, she is uh, nothing but a, a pawn in his game to secure an heir for Uther Pendragon. And I really wanted to look at her, at how she would feel, but also to find a rationale um, a, a way of explaining why she does what she does in the myths, insofar as we, we learn uh, what she does. Yeah, you know, her husband is killed, she is bamboozled with magic, and then she marries Uther Pendragon. Why would anyone do woman do that? Well, let's find a, a way to explain it. Her youngest daughter in the thread, because there are so many different threads of um, the various Arthurian legends, is Morgana. Um, she's very much younger than uh, Igraine and um, Gorlois of Cornwall's elder daughters, who are by this stage are married and living away. So Morgana is six years old or thereabouts when um, her father is killed, her home is um, destroyed or certainly invaded, and her whole life is turned upside down. And suddenly she gets this younger half brother. So again, how would that affect her? How would growing up in this as this half sister to a king eventually, how would that affect her? How would her relationship with her mother work? Things like that. So again, um, what would that, what would that make her as a woman as she grew up? How would that influence her? How would that influence her behaviour? And then we have Guinevere, who again, I've always felt gets you know the raw end of the deal because she is married off to Arthur and she she does her best to be a good girl but there's no air and that that's becomes very much a point in this story but it's it's yeah. certainly a factor in all of the retellings Arthur has no child well we all know certainly historically the woman got the blame for that so we have these women and the other thing about these women is their stories are going to overlap in all of the retellings the standard retellings women come in and out of the story because the main focus is arthur and the knights of the round table and merlin it's a very male centric narrative and the women come in and out either to do something or be something uh you know for plot purposes and then they disappear well what happens to them do they sit in a cupboard um <laughs> These women, their lives would have overlapped. They would have talked to each other. And to, to give, as it were, continuity to those relationships, I've also drawn on Nimue, who, again, she crops up in a lot of the retellings. She's a sorceress. She's a supernatural being. And there are lots, there's a great deal of, I found a great deal of freedom um, because the myths, the version of the myths that she crops up in, they're not exactly self-contradictory, but they are very different in focus and you know, the ideas of what she does are very different. So I was able to sort of basically weave my own story for her from those various different threads. So she starts off as Igraine's maidservant. She helps raise Morgana 
And then as the years pass, because she is not growing old in the way that anyone else does, she becomes Guinevere's confidant and servant, um, which means she has a front row seat to Merlin's shenanigans and the um, unintended consequences of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, before reading The Cleaving, I also recently read um, Bernard Corwell's Winter King, which is obviously also about the time of King Arthur and mm. as you mentioned I noticed some similarities but also lots of differences in the events of the cleaving and not just because it was it was focusing on the women. I was wondering for those of us that are new to Arthurian mythology and also how it may fit into any established history how does researching this type of book work and you know how can you tell us a bit about the sources that you used for inspiration and what you chose to add to yourself? Well, one of the things that I've been very aware of in recent retellings and uh, both in books and movies is that there has been this focus on who might a historical Arthur actually have been. Would he have been uh, you know, a Roman Britain? Would he have been you know, a Saxons, an early um, Dark Ages warrior, you know, even an ancient Britain? And those are all very interesting questions, and people have, so people have talk, were woven very interesting stories around them. And as you know, somebody who's very interested in history, I've read a fair few of those and thought, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't have anything more interesting to say about that. So there's a there's another strand to the Arthurian tales, which has probably possibly sunk into the background a bit, certainly in the recent recent decades. And that's the magic and the mystery and the high fantasy. Um, I went back and read Gem Geoffrey of Monmouth and you know the very early mentions where Arthur is very much, the tale is being concocted to bolster current political claims to the power, claims to the throne. But I also went back and read uh, Mallory's Mort Data, which I haven't looked at in decades. And one of the things that struck me really forcefully was just how much swords and sorcery there is in that retelling. Um, it's, you know, there are magic swords all over the place. It's not just Excalibur. There are strange, unearthly women, many of whom for some reason are called, called Elaine. Uh, Mallory was a bit um, un uninventive when it came to women's names. Oh, or they're just a damsel. Um, <laughs> But there are these strange places and these strange individuals with very um, unexpected power. There's deception, there's curses, there's prophecy. As I say, all of these things which actually do eventually work their way into the epic fantasy tradition, the popular fiction that developed into epic fantasy as we know it today. Mm -hmm. And then there are the French medieval retellings, um, the ones that came over from, from Chrétien de Troyes, please excuse my French, and similar tales. Uh, there's um, a medieval French woman writer called Marie de France, who wrote various lays. And that's where we get the a lot of the high romance and the chivalry. And But again, there's magic, there's deception, there's... Um, unexpected twists and turns and strange magical creatures, individuals crop up in those stories. So I decided that, as I say, I couldn't add anything more or interesting or new to was there a historical Arthur? But I could get to grips with the swords and sorcery aspect of it. And I thought, yeah, there was a lot of potential there. And I really enjoyed writing it. Yeah, I mean, sor the swords and sorcery are the good bit, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so The Cleaving's not your first book incorporating British mythology. Did you grow up with folk tales and legends or did you become interested in them as an adult? No, I absolutely grew up with them. Um, I learned to read when I was three, not because I was any sort of child prodigy, but because I've got a brother who's two years older than I am. So he started school at the age of five with the Ladybird keywords reading scheme, which you are far too young to remember. <laughs> and I, you know that you have those sort of snapshot memories from when you're very small. Mm -hmm. I can vividly remember sitting on the settee in the lounge with, 
with my mother sitting with my brother doing his reading book and me sitting on my the, my mother's other side giving it what was going on there because that was really interesting and that's how I learned to read <laughs> and this was um well late 60s early 70s um so libraries then had all sorts of absolutely fascinating books school bookshelves in the classroom had all sorts of fascinating books and you would really you'd get narnia and tales of witches from the scottish highlands and rj unstead's history of britain starting with king arthur would all be on the same shelf mm -hmm. so um with the reading that i grew up with history and myth and fantasy were actually just different points on the same spectrum yeah. so i i grew up and then i started reading things like the weird son of brisingerman and a lot of the other children's writers when i was um yeah, who were at their peak when i was a kid they were drawing on british fantasy they were drawing on the myths particularly the british landscape and so i grew up with those though actually i hadn't realized quite how much of that i'd absorbed until i started writing the green man books which are my series dealing with um british drawing on british folklore and mythology um it's been quite interesting to realize how much of that very very early reading you know and we are talking more than 50 years ago has still stayed with me and influenced me it's interesting yeah formative experience in the yeah. library yeah yeah, yeah absolutely um okay moving on what am i going to ask you about next oh yes N nimue is the protagonist of this book yes. mainly and we get to know her the best yeah but was there any other character that you particularly enjoyed writing about when you got to them you, it was getting to, getting to the good bit um i like i enjoyed actually write, writing all of them for different reasons yeah um Morgana's sharp edges were particularly rewarding to write because again you know you have these fragments of her story um when the the narrative the narrative is centered on Arthur you get her story in bits and pieces and again working out what how to working out an underlying thread how those different be bits and pieces could be strung together in a way that made coherent sense that made her a fully rounded individual with uh, understandable motivations was really interesting and guinevere actually turned out to be a, a lot more interesting in some ways to write than i was necessarily expecting um writing good girls is quite a challenge because i've done this before in other books and if you're not careful, they can be very dull. <laughs> um, and actually, again, presenting Guinevere as somebody who was quiet and good and obedient, but nevertheless had a core of steel. That as as the story un unfolded, that became more and more interesting to write, particularly when we get to the final few chapters. Yes. Yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, were there any other scenes or characters that didn't kind of didn't turn out the way you expected when you first started planning out the book? Any surprises? Ooh, um, uh, hmm, spoilers. Um, a couple, <laughs> a couple of comment, a couple of early comments have indicated that people think I'm possibly being a little unfair to Arthur. Oh. Um, and I shall be very interested to see what people think about that because actually, I think if you, well, no, re not read between the lines, um, Arthur gets a raw deal as well, and I don't, and I don't think I may not be particularly sympathetic, but I don't think, you know, I think I sort of do flag up that um, a very, very macho male-dominated, honour-driven. Um, martial culture um actually does the men no more favors than it does the women in a lot of ways um so yes again finding a an, an underlying psychological coherence for arthur was a interesting challenge as well 
Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, to me, Arthur's definitely, he's, you know, born into circumstances he didn't choose just as mm-hmm. much as, just as much as for some of the other characters. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, okay, so I we have quite a few uh, aspiring and early career authors in our community and fantasy mm-hmm. fellowship. And your debut novel, The Thief's Gamble, came out in 1999. And you've now written, I believe, over 20 novels over yes. your different writing identities. Um, looking back to 1999, what advice would you now give yourself as a debut author? Well, I now I first signed my first contract in 97. All right. <laughs> um, we actually waited to put the first book out in 99 so that we could put the two, first two out in the same calendar year. Um, the world has changed immeasurably in 25 years. Um, and actually, so that the one of the most important things for any early career writer at the moment is make sure your information is up to date because um it is a different world it is absolutely a different world in 25 years ago the expectation was that if you could build a readership over your first four or five books then you know you would start getting into what you would start earning out advances you would start getting into royalties you would um if uh, you know, if you wrote good enough books and you built sufficient readership, you might be able to give up the day job after books, you know, six or seven. And then, you know, writing one good solid book a year, you could earn a modest living. And that was true. And certainly for my first 10 years as a writer, that was true. That is not true anymore. Um, the book selling landscape has changed completely. We have Waterstones, we have one high street chain bookshop, we have Amazon. But we also have a myriad of excellent small presses. Um, writers can communicate with readers through websites like this. Yeah. Um, through the marvels of technology in ways that we never could before. Um, ebooks have transformed the landscape. Audiobooks, when audiobooks first came in, yeah, they were only for the best sellers because yeah, producing tape cassettes was expensive. Once audiobooks started coming in digital downloads, that side of the market was completely transformed. So the most important thing, I think, for early career writers is make sure your information is up to date and know what your options are. Be flexible, be, be um, but also be, where is probably not the right word, astute, shrewd, um, intelligent. This is a business. And most people, most publishers are, you know, passionate about books and uh, out to do their best. Doesn't always necessarily mean they're going to be have the technical or business skills to achieve what they want. So, you know, you need to do your due diligence. And if you're offered a contract, do not sign it without reading it very thoroughly. And ideally, take it to an organisation like the Society of Authors um, so that they can read it for you. They can see any obvious pitfalls, um, any obvious snags and advise you on ways to make it better. I mean, I did that with my very first contract, say, in 1997. I took it to the Society of Authors and um, they we had a good chat about it and I sent it back to the publisher with you know these are the clauses we will add these are the clauses we will change and these are the clauses we will delete not a lot of first-time writers do that yeah it was very important that I did subsequently um, I took one contract to the society for their advice because I looked at it and thought no I'm not all sure about this and they said <laughs> forget it, you'd be better off publishing yourself with Kindle Direct Publishing. And I can't name, I'm not going to name and shame the publisher because they have subsequently gone out of business. So, uh, you know, um, the writing in some ways, you know, there there's vast amounts of advice on technique of writing, on style, on craft, on how to improve your writing. Take the bits that work for you. If you see some advice that doesn't work for you, don't follow it. Um, you know, not every piece of advice is right for everybody. No two writers work the same. So there's a vast amount of a very good and varied advice on the craft of writing. 
make sure you look for advice on the business of writing as well. I think that's excellent advice. <laughs> well, that, well, that is one reason why I'm still here after 25 years. <laughs> um, OK, um, still on writing in general, um, mm -hmm. would you be able to describe your writing process? Like, how do you get from blank page or blank screen to a finished article or a finished first draft, I suppose? And has your process changed over your career? I am very much um, old school in that I start work with uh, one of these. So in this house as a thinking stick, also known as pencil. Um, I will, I'm a planner. There are two, across the broad spectrum of writers, there are two essential types. There's planners and discovery writers. The discovery writer writes chapter one, go and sees where the story takes them. Um, I, it, it's a process that I've heard described as uh, driving a car by night. You can just see a little bit ahead in the um, headlights and once you get there you can see a bit further ahead and a bit further ahead and a bit further ahead. And I know people for whom that works superbly. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> um, I, before I start typing chapter one, I will know the beginning, the middle and the, near, the end of a story. Um, I will have it plotted out. Um, I will have the, the the sort of broad beats of the story. If there's a subplot that will be worked in, I will have a, a piece of paper with different columns and asterisks and lines and arrows and bits scribbled out. And when I started out, I those notes were very, very much more detailed than they are now. Um, these days I have sufficient confidence in my own abilities to leave gaps and bits that say, yeah, and here's something exciting will happen. Um, and before I arrive at that, generally I will have worked out what that is. Um, I do, as I say, I do still plot and, but before I actually get to that stage, I will have various ideas and I, the ideas will show me what I want to read more about. I mean, I'm just starting work on the, the next Green Man book at the moment. And um, <laughs> an idea that I have had has led me to research access to otherwise inaccessible bits of the British countryside. And things that I have turned up as a result of that will feed into the story. And um, I was watching something completely unrelated about gang wars in Glasgow. And I suddenly realized one aspect of that actually could feed into this story. So I'm very open minded when I'm in the sort of story building phase of it. And also these days, when I, when I first started uh, my fifth novel, The Assassin's Edge, um, which I sold a proposal and I'd agreed with my editor and you know as far as we were both concerned I'd done a detailed synopsis we knew exactly where the story was going and I'd written I think the first third of it where a big exciting thing was due to happen and I heard a radio program about something completely different and I thought you know what actually that's going to work re much better than my original idea and by that stage, and I absolutely was, oh, well, help that I have my plan and it's beautiful and I've typed it up and we've agreed it and what am I going to do? So I actually got in touch with my editor and said, um, Tim, about the these things, I'm thinking pirates instead. And I'm very fortunate that um, Tim, my then editor, went, yeah, OK, that sounds good. <laughs> Because by that stage, I say this was the fifth book we'd worked on. Um, he had sufficient confidence in me. In fact, I think possibly by that stage, he had slightly more confidence in my abilities than I did, that I would be able to make this work. And so now, umpty um books later, if I'm going down a particular plot line that I have thought is going to work, and I realise actually, you know what, this isn't going to pan out the way I wanted, or a better idea has subsequently come up along and kicked me in the shins. I now will not be agonising about um, changing my mind. I'll be going, oh, right, OK, let's get on with that. <laughs> the one exception to this, actually, 
is this book, The Cleaving, because um, I'm always looking for a new creative challenge. Every book I write, I want to do something different to the, what I've written before. I want to give myself a new challenge, find new uh, areas to explore. And of course, with this, I was writing within an established framework. Um, one of the things that has, yeah, I, people had sort of said to me, have you ever thought of writing an Arthurian book, Jules? No. Um, why? Well, we know how it ends and it's not good. <laughs> and yeah, so I was sort of getting closer and closer to the end of this and thinking, yeah, all respect to John Borman, the end of this book has got to be more than a battlefield of bloody slaughter. And I was much, much further down the process with this book before I saw how everything was going to come together to make the ending more than a field of bloody slaughter that I necessarily expected when it did all suddenly come together that was a huge relief um normally i am much more certain of the end of a book before i get quite that close to writing it <laughs> constrained by the legends <laughs> yes well it's a bit like doing um intellectual property work um sort of tie-in work i've done a few short stories um for uh, i don't, did a couple for doctor who i've done a, short, a warhammer one uh did a torchwood one and working within the constraints of somebody else's or a, another established imaginative world. It's a really interesting creative challenge. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, that's similar to what I have here. Yeah, <laughs> I can see it. I never thought I'd think of uh, Torchwood and uh, Arthurian legend in the same way. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. OK, um, so what is the oddest thing that you've had to google or otherwise look up as part of research for your books or as part of making something work we always hear about author search histories oh, what's in yours? <laughs> yes um oh that is a that is quite a challenging question um well um a lot of the woodworking uh skills that uh daniel mcmain the protagonist of my green man books because he's a carpenter and i am not um my husband is extremely uh practical he's a you know dab hand at diying just about anything um he needs to do and my brother-in-law is a builder they've worked on very old houses so a lot of the questions i have i can ask them um but when it comes to the fine detail of woodworking um, particularly working with different woods, um, f finding out exactly what levels of toxicity you sawdust, you wood sawdust, um, has say how toxic that is and the problems that presents. That, that one was quite interesting to look up. But you find very, very enthusiastic communities online discussing all sorts of fascinating things. Um, and I wrote a, I wrote a steampunk novella last year for Newcom Press called The Golden Rule, in which uh, there are dastardly do doings afoot uh, for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. And so I had to do a lot of research into exactly what the Metropolitan Police equipment was at the time and how to load and unload a particular sort of revolver. Um, but again, I found a YouTube channel um, with an American, a very grey haired, moustached, serious American uh, firearms enthusiast who, yeah, in case you find one of these in your grandfather's sock drawer, which presumably can happen in America, though it doesn't happen in the UK, it, it was exactly the sort of gun that I needed to know about. And he, you know, there was a video demonstrating how you loaded it, how you unloaded it, and it wasn't the way you might have imagined. So, and I can't even remember if I go into very much detail about that in this novella, but if I didn't know it, it would show, I don't, uh, certainly as a reader, you can, even subliminally, I find as a reader, you can tell if a writer is busking it. Re research is, it's like the iceberg, you know, nine tenths of it is below the waterline, nine tenths of it never makes its way into the book. 
Um, oh, and the other fascinating thing I researched um, in, again, with the re research for that book is spiritualism in the 18 whenevers. Um, and the very, because you, you know, we've all heard about a Ouija board, we've all heard about a planchette, you know, the automatic writing thing. There were some absolutely fascinating gizmos, including some that people still have no idea how they actually worked, because there was an awful lot of uh, chicanery and charlatans involved. But there are some of these gizmos that nobody knows how the results were faked. Mm -hmm. Words, which obviously then the question becomes, were the results faked? Um, so that was fascinating. Yeah, I mean, every book is an excuse to buy intriguing books and spend hours on the internet looking up all sorts of fascinating things. <laughs> I love that. Um, OK, um, one of our community members, Max, is a big fan of yours. And when he found out I would be speaking to you, he asked me if I would kindly ask you the next couple of questions. So, Max, okay. here we go. So he said, you've expressed before that writing the last book in a series is difficult as with the Assassin's Edge and that um, things like putting enough backstory in and tying all the loose ends up for characters mm. as well as bringing the series to a satisfying conclusion are all their own challenges. Um, do you still feel this way? Has it, is it, has it gotten any easier as you've concluded series? Um, I do still feel that way and no, it hasn't got any easier. Um, <laughs> if anything, I have become more aware of, I have become more, more aware how important it is to provide a satisfying conclusion, which is not necessarily the same as a happy ending. Mm -hmm. but having now done that because uh, what there are four separate series in the fantasy uh, novels I've written um, I have learned more about how to do it um, one of the things about the Green Man books is there you know it's an ongoing series and it's a standalone um, uh, there are threads emerging but it's not you know, it's, it's not like with the Lescar Revolution or the Hadrimal Crisis, where those were specifically planned as a trilogy with a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, so this is a different sort of writing at the moment. Um, yes, winding things up in a satisfactory manner is a considerable challenge. Um, but, you know, if it was easy, uh, it wouldn't be worth doing. Um, Max also asks, uh, he says, in an interview in an interview back in 1999, here we go, oh, no. I know, when asked about how, how fantasy would change in the next 20 years, you <laughs> said that perceptions of fantasy would change, it would get a wider audience and reviewers would be keen to recommend a good novel which happens to be a fantasy story and not disregarding swords and sorcery and also that advances in special effects technology should mean more TV and film adaptations would be made. So, I mean, I know what I think in this one, but it, Max would like to know, would you say that the literary world has proved your predictions? And he would also like to know what your prediction is for the next 20 years, because you, you've obviously got that skill. <laughs> well, I should start buying lottery tickets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wasn't I a genius? <laughs> um, I think, yes, um, I am very pleased to see uh, that uh, a lot of the um snobbery if you like about um fantasy fiction has uh evaporated we have all sort a great many different writers to thank for that from margaret atwood through neil gaiman um through to the team behind the expanse and uh game of thrones um sorry what was the question <laughs> i'm just st <laughs> sitting here amazed I mean, uh, how uh, pressing uh, it was yeah, I mean, apart from your psychic abilities, he was um, <laughs> he he was wondering where where you felt things might go from here. Will that will be more of the same? I think what we're seeing at the moment is uh, yeah, you know, what we have seen in the last twenty years is um, when my first novel came out, Thief Gamble, the reviews were going, oh great, you know, uh, a female lead character who is not, uh, one of the early reviews said something along the lines of, not the usual victim of tepid victim and plot coupon, or words to that effect. Within 10 years, 
Livak was a very mainstream heroine. There were a lot of confident women with agency involved in and driving the plot of fantasy novels. And I think what we're going to see now and what we are already seeing is um, the broad range of protagonists broadening still further. We're going to start to see, well, we are already seeing non-binary protagonists. We're starting to see um, same-sex couples, trans characters, not because we have we are going to make a point and be broad-minded and inclusive, but simply because they're there. It's a different world. It's not our world. These people are part of that world. And we're starting to see writers uh, drawing on all sorts of myths and all sorts of cultures. One of the best things I've read, read in a long time was Fonda Lee's Greenbone Saga, um, which was an absolute classic fant second, fantasy secondary world. You have the heir to the family dynasty who is not necessarily suited to it, the one who wants to negotiate and um, find a way to live with the deadly rivals which isn't necessarily going to work out we have the you know, anointed princess who doesn't want to be all of which could have been absolutely high epic fantasy castles knights swords and sorcery except it's a modern fat secondary world with cars and televisions and trade and airplanes and bioenergetic jade, which conveys essentially the sort of powers that you see in Hong Kong cinema, you know, to leap and to fight and to run and all the rest of it. Um, and I think what we're going to see is an awful lot more invention, a lot more um, innovation, both in terms of characters and in what people see fantasy can do. We're going to see different cultures, different backgrounds, different time periods. I say it's already happening. Um, and I think it's really going to enrich the genre for readers and writers alike. And I think one of the other things we're going to see is that a lot of this really innovative writing is going to be coming out of small presses. Because the state of the mass market book trade being what it is at the moment, the big publishers are trying to chase after big names and established success and yeah that's okay that's their business that's how their business works it's not necessarily as open to the off the wall ideas as it was 25 years ago but what we have now are small presses who can reach readers direct with ebooks in a way that um 25 years ago yeah nobody even dreamt of yeah um, we, we love small presses and we love the Green Brown saga. <laughs> this, will, this will resonate resonate am, with our viewers. I am really, really hoping that that does get a really good TV adaptation. I think it will be absolutely fantastic on the screen. Yes, it's it, it's like a it's like an amazing series of, of films as you're reading it. I, I yeah. agree. Absolutely. Um, OK, so I guess, I, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you this one next then. Um, we find that authors have the best book recommendations, as you've just proved. Um, <laughs> but do, in, in terms of mytho myth mythology, do you have a favourite mythological retelling that you've read? Ooh, um, I don't tend to go for mythological retellings because I tend to know the way they're going to end and frequently it's not good. Um, <laughs> There are some writers, there are some writers, in fact, there are quite a few writers at the moment doing very interesting things with fairy stories. One of the really interesting things about working in fantasy fiction at the moment is the genre seems to be rediscovering its roots going back before Tolkien. Um, I've, I was speaking, speaking about the way that actually it's surprising how much of the Arthurian swords and sorcery ideas still fed in there they came through the victorian popular literature and they fed into epic fantasy you know and that cuts both ways but also there are a lot of writers at the moment looking at the ways fairy tales have fed into epic fantasy without necessarily us realizing it 
Um, Liz Williams is doing uh, some very interesting books. She's writing a series that starts with Comet Weather. That's very good. Uh, Kit Whitfield. Um, yes. In the Heart of Hidden Things. And that's about a fairy smith. And it's an absolutely intriguing book. It's really, really interesting. Um, Naomi Novik, Spinning Silver. Again, looking at taking a fairy tale idea as a starting point um, and then doing something new, innovative and quite unexpected with it sort of creatively. So those tend to be the things that I if I'm reading something that's inspired by myth, that tends to be the thing I'll gravitate. Those are things I'll gravitate towards rather than necessarily a straight retelling. Um, and can you recommend us a book or a couple that you've enjoyed? And the, the just general books doesn't have to be anything to do with mythology that you've enjoyed and you think deserve a bit more love. We like a bit of to be read list intensification. <laughs> um, a book that I will always champion is This Is Not A Game by Walter John Williams which is, I mean, it's must be it's quite an old book now, but it's the start of um, three books that look, about, look at our relationship with um, celebrity, our relationship with online culture. Uh, Dagmar Shaw is um, a sort of games designer who gets caught up in a revolution and basically crowdsources her way out of it. Um, which, uh, and again, this is quite an old book, so the tech may be a bit dated these days, but um, it's, a, it's a great fun yarn. Walter John Williams is a fantastic writer, and he's also a really nice guy. Um, and it's, they're really interesting books. It's one of the, <laughs> I was reading it on the train coming back from London, and it's the one in, occasion when somebody has actually sort of, well commented on the book I was reading and it was, you know, it was sort of late at night and there was this other guy on the train and he sort of looked up and he said I, I hope I don't mind you you know me interrupting you but that's such a good book isn't it <laughs> um, and he again and he'd never come across anyone else who'd read it and he loved it as well and we had an absolutely fascinating chat until he, he, we reached his stop um so yeah this is not a game by Walter John Williams look it up it's worth 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 a read Excellent, thank you. Um, so, and this is my final question. Um, as we record this, um, The Cleaving is still to be published. It is. Um, how do you like to celebrate when one of your books gets published? Ooh, um, well, I will certainly open a nice bottle of wine and my husband and I will probably have a takeaway so that I don't have to cook. I mean, I like cooking, but um yeah and even the off the off cooking is uh, always welcome um mostly what i really enjoy is seeing other people enjoying the book that's that's what really gives me a buzz um and so yeah so these days uh, as i say we're 24 25 novels in um we, Eastercon will be happening literally the weekend before this official publication date. So I suspect that I will be raising a few glasses in the bar with very good friends. Um, one of the other things that uh, I would very much recommend to beginner writers is make friends with other writers, not to ruthlessly network, to grab all the lucrative opportunities that come your way, because that's really not how it works. But this business is very unpredictable. It can be quite unforgiving. And over the ups and downs of the last 25 years, my friends, my fellow writers, the ones who really understand this weird business we're in, those are the people that have sustained me. So when I have a new book out, those tend to be the people that I will want to celebrate with because those are the people that when I've been writing a book and I thought can I do this oh, I'm not really sure they're the people I will have spoken to they're all the people who all have said yeah go on you know we have faith in you Jules even if at the points where I've been giving it what am I doing um so yes those are the people I tend to look to to celebrate with 
whether that's in person or online. That's lovely. <laughs> OK, um, right. That is all the questions. Um, thank you so much to Julia for joining us today and thank you to you all for tuning in. Remember, The Cleaving is out on April the 11th. It's published by Angry Robot Books and it will be available from your usual quality book purveyors. You can learn more about Julia and her work at her website www.julietemckenna.com and she's on Twitter where she's at Julia E. McKenna. If you've enjoyed the Q&A today, please do hit like on our video, let us know what you think in the comments box and subscribe to our channel for more author Q&As, fandom deep dives and buddy read reviews. We'd also love to have you on our Fellowship Community Discord server. The best way to get there is by visiting our website www.fantasy-fellowship.co.uk and we're also on social media. On Instagram we are at fantasy underscore fellowship and on Twitter, we are at Fan Fellowship. If you'd like to support us in bringing you more content and giveaways, we now have a coffee page, which is linked in the description below. Until next time, bye for now.